Welcome, and thank you for joining me to share in the Word of God. I'm excited about these lessons as we travel through Acts, and today we're in Acts chapter 2, 14, verses 14 through 36. Before we get started, we need to remind you of the scene that has taken place. The 120, the apostles, the mother of Jesus, many of the women that followed with Jesus, they were meeting in the upper room, waiting for the Holy Spirit. Well, the Holy Spirit has come. A mighty rushing wind came upon them. Tongues of fire appeared. When the crowd gathered, they started speaking. And the crowd was amazed that they were hearing about the mighty works of God in their own native languages. And it was an incredible scene. They were all drawn together, and some were saying, What does this mean? As we talked about last week. But others said, Well, I think they're just drunk. They're all speaking in all these different tongues. They must be they must be intoxicated. And therefore, we come up to today's scene. The crowd is gathered. They're hearing all these mighty works of God in their own languages. Some are skeptical. And Peter decides to stand up and clarify the situation. But Peter, standing with the eleven, lifted up his voice and addressed them. Men of Judea, all of you who dwell in Jerusalem, let this be known to you and give ear to my words. For these people are not drunk, as you suppose, since it is only the third hour of the day. But this is what was uttered through the prophet Joel. Now, as soon as Peter said the prophet Joel, everyone would have perked up. Any Jew stood silent to listen to the word of God. And so he's caught their attention by mentioning the prophet Joel. And in the last days it shall be, God declares, that I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. And your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, and your young men shall see visions, and your old men shall dream dreams. Even on my male servants and female servants in those days, I will pour out my spirit, and they shall prophesy. And I will show wonders in the heavens above and signs on the earth below, blood and fire and vapor of smoke, and the sun shall be turned to darkness, and the moon to blood, before the day of the Lord comes, the great and magnificent day. And it shall come to pass that everyone who calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Men of Israel, hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, a man attested to you, by God, with mighty works and wonders and signs that God did through him and in your midst, as you yourselves know, this Jesus delivered up according to the definite plan and foreknowledge of God, you crucified and killed by the hands of lawless men. God raised him up, loosing the pains of death because it was not possible for him to be held by it. For David says concerning him, I saw the Lord always before me, and he is at my right hand, that I may not be shaken. Therefore my heart was glad and my tongue rejoiced. My flesh also will dwell in hope, for you will not abandon my soul to Hades, or let your Holy One see corruption. You have made known to me the paths of life. You will make me full of gladness with your presence. Brothers, I may say to you with confidence about the patriarch David that he both died and was buried and, and his tomb is with us to this day. Being therefore a prophet and knowing that God had sworn with an oath to him that he would one, set one of his descendants on his throne, he foresaw and spoke about the resurrection of Christ, that he was not abandoned to Hades, nor did his flesh see corruption. Jesus this Jesus God raised up, and of that we are all witnesses. Being therefore exalted at the right hand of God, and having received from the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit, he has poured out this, that you yourselves are seeing and hearing. For David did not ascend into the heavens, but he himself says, The Lord said to my Lord, Sit at my right hand, until I make your enemies your footstool. Let all the house of Israel therefore know for certain that God has made him both Lord and Christ, this Jesus whom you crucified. 
I have a feeling Peter paused there, left it hanging. He, he's, he's, he's telling them the gospel of Jesus Christ for the first time. This is the first recorded presentation of the gospel. And he's talking as a Jew to other Jews, but he's a Jew that knows Jesus. And he's te teaching fellow Jews who maybe haven't committed to Jesus yet, don't understand the full meaning. They had seen Jesus, they had heard him speak, they had seen some of his miracles, perhaps, but they hadn't fully committed, they hadn't really understood. And so Peter's trying to explain to them, and he, he sort of ends his message, I think, in a, in a way that, that all preachers of the word should end, with a, with a message that, that sort of leaves you hanging. It, it, it calls for some kind of response. Quoting from Joel, he says, in the last days, and again, with that quote from Joel, he grabs their attention. They always listen to the words of the prophets. And he says, God declares that I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. That's all. One A, two L's. And I, I, if you check the original language, Greek or Hebrew, it means all, every. That's important to understand. And your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, your young men shall see visions, and your old men shall see dream dreams. He's telling them the Spirit of God knows no social bounds. There's no particular group that's going to get it, and some other group won't. The, it's not going to be just Jews. It's going to be Jews and Gentiles. It's not going to be just the young or just the old. It's not going to be just the men. It's going to be all. It's not going to be just the educated, not the elite, the, 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 the political powers. No, he's going to pour out his spirit on all flesh. God's spirit does not know social bounds. And God, I think, enjoys using the least likely people to do great works through, so that you're aware that it must be God working in that person because they themselves are just a normal human being. Salvation is definitely relational. Haven't you ever been sort of fascinated or come, thought of, why would God go to all this trouble and then leave the spreading of the message to us? I mean, we're all weak, selfish sinners. And you, and you just sort of wonder about that. He, he, he went to all this trouble, prophesied, led up to Jesus coming. Jesus came and was crucified. And then he said, and you share the message. Well, he didn't just leave it to us. He poured out his spirit upon us. And, 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 and it's that sharing of the message that, that, that displays the relational nature of who God is. And it says, And it shall come to pass that everyone who calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. What an incredible verse. But we need to break it down just a little. There are those who would take this strictly, literally, in English. That if you just sort of say the name of God, that somehow that means you're saved. But when, when the Bible talks about calling upon the name of the Lord, it's talking about engaging with him intimately in a relationship. It's talking about recognizing he's God and we're not, and therefore listening to his words, obeying his commands, following his lead. That when you call upon the name of the Lord, you're connecting relationally. And Peter's making it very clear. I mean, you, you, you want to talk about a Trinitarian sermon. He's making it very clear. Salvation is from God through the blood of Jesus, the death, burial, and resurrection, and by the power of the Holy Spirit, that this is the Godhead all working together. This is the culmination of what has been prophesied throughout the scriptures. It, it, and again, the very fact that you have God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit shows that even within the Godhead, there's, there's a community. There's a relationship that God in his very essence is relational, and that's why his creation, his human beings, are so relational. And that he wants his message, the message of salvation, the message of the death, burial, and the resurrection of Jesus to be relational as well, to, that, 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 that we should share. Most people involved in church are there because of a close friend or a relative. Those are just the statistics. That it's, it's when we share the message of what God has done for us that we begin to reach others 
to Christ. And there's one other thing to understand here that I think is really important. We can get caught up in the manifestations of the Holy Spirit. We can get caught up in the gifts of the Holy Spirit, whether it be healing or tongue speaking or prophecy. Those are things that fascinate a lot of us. and We can get caught up in it and actually lose sight of the purpose. The reason we have the gift of tongues, the reason those, those gifts were poured out, was so that the message of Jesus Christ could get out. The Holy Spirit is all about getting the message of Jesus out. He's, he's not trying to wow you with the gifts. Those gifts are the vehicles to get everyone the message of Jesus. And so for people who claim to have the Holy Spirit, they need to be people who are constantly trying to share the message of Jesus because that's who he is. And if he is dwelling within us, then that's who we will be as well. From the beginning, this was the plan. This Jesus delivered up according to the definite plan and foreknowledge of God. You crucified and killed by the hands of lawless men. There, there are so many people that have this idea that somehow God failed. Somehow God tried, you know, he tried at first to create, you know, a perfect society. And it got so bad he had to flood the whole world. And then he tried again with the Mosaic law, with Abraham and everything. And somehow that failed. And so then he sends Jesus, you know, this is like a workaround. This is some way to, to sort of, you know, cover up the failure and try it a new way. And that's just, that's just so far from the truth. It's so far from any understanding of Scripture. That, that, that Jesus, the coming of the Christ, the coming of the Messiah, was always the plan from the beginning. God knew what he was doing. He knew human beings would be weak and selfish and sinful. He knew that we would reject him. And he knew he had to, from the beginning, come up with a way to cover our sins. And to show the great love, the great grace, the, the, the compassion, to show how much God loved us, he sent his only son to die on a cross and be raised from the dead so that we could be saved. That was the plan from the beginning, always. And anyone who was familiar with the Old Testament would have been aware of that. And Peter was reminding them, he's explaining to his fellow Jews, this, this was always part of the plan. This is the, the, the Messiah that we've been waiting for. They all knew that the Messiah was coming, and they were waiting, they were looking and seeing. And, and Jesus is letting him know, it was Jesus. We were here, you saw him. We saw him. He did great works. He, his words drew people in. This is what we've all been waiting for the Christ, the Son of God. God raised him up. This Jesus God raised up and that we are all witnesses, being therefore exalted at the right hand of God, having received from the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit. He has poured out this that you yourselves are seeing and hearing. Do you see what Peter's doing? I mean, he's telling them, we're witnesses. We walked with Jesus. We talked with Jesus. We saw his miracles. We, we, we saw him crucified. We saw him raised from the dead. We're witnesses. But what Peter's doing in all of this is he's saying, not only are we witnesses, now you're witnesses too. He's letting them know, you saw Jesus too. You saw his miracles. You saw everything we're telling you. You know the scriptures. You know what we're telling you is true. So now not only are we the witnesses, but so are you. You are seeing the mighty works of God in action right now as we speak and as you hear the word of God in all of your native tongues. Now you have a responsibility, just as well as we do, to share what you have seen and heard. Two, two words that are very popular with the author Luke as he writes through the gospel and the Acts of the Apostles. The main point, Peter, Peter leads to this Final climax is he's talking about, let all the house of Israel know, therefore, know for certain that God has made him both Lord and Christ, this Jesus whom you crucify. I think he just sort of let that sink in. You have all those stories where, you know, someone is down and then they become the leader. I, I've often thought of the, the story of Joseph where Potiphar and his wife turn against him and get him thrown in prison. And we never know what happens to them. We never hear an after story. But don't you always wonder when, 
when Pharaoh made him the second most powerful man in Egypt? Don't you think Potiphar and his wife kind of ducked in the crowd when Joseph drove by in the royal chariot? And G Peter's making the same point. You know, the guy you crucified, yeah, he's now Lord and Christ. He sits at the right hand of God, the one you just crucified. Think about how that affected the crowd who heard him. Those who were yelling, crucify him, crucify him, suddenly realizing now, yeah, that guy. He's now Lord in Christ, and we're responsible. He left it hanging. Peter preaches a sermon that demands a response. And I think that is so what we need today. We need to live our lives as sermons that demand a response. We need to live and speak in such a way that people say, "What? there's something different about you. There's something strange. There's something, something attractive, but... You know, how come you have such a successful marriage? Why do you have such good relationships and friends? Why, why do you have such good relationships with your children? There needs to be something about Christian living that demands a response, that people want to react to, that people want to question. What is it you got that we don't? But then there's one other question here. This is one of those tricky parts when you're reading through Luke and and Acts is, you get the actual story, you get the setting of the actual story, and we've talked about that, Peter at Pentecost, the 120 gathered, and, and they're all there, and, and suddenly people start hearing the message, and, and what you have is Jewish Christians committed to Jesus, trying to convince Jews that aren't committed to make the commitment. That's what's going on in the story. But then you have to sort of realize, who is Luke, the author of Acts, preaching to? Well, we know from the introduction he's talking to Theophilus and whoever the group is with him. But what's his point in all of this? Because it's different than what Peter's was. Peter, we get that original story. But what was the effect Luke was hoping to have on his audience? His audience is predominantly Gentile. The Greek in Luke is really, you know, collegiate Greek. It's, it's very high Greek. Whoever this was were, were educated people in Greek, educated in all senses. And so he's preaching to a predominantly Gentile audience, not a Jewish audience. They've never seen Jesus. They're not familiar with the apostles. They're not familiar with the stories. They did not hear him teach or, or see his miracles. They're not familiar with all of those things. And here's the problem, and here's what I think gets it where we're headed here. In the face of persecution... Again, Luke's writing probably 30 years at least after the crucifixion and resurrection of Jesus. And there's a lot of Gentile Christians who were converted. They heard the gospel, they heard the stories, and they committed their lives to Jesus. But in the face of persecution, they're starting to ask the question, was that real? You know, when you're facing torture and death, you start to question your beliefs. Are they worth dying for? Are they worth standing up for? Are they worth suffering for? And so as these Gentile Christians are starting to face all these problems, I think that's what motivated Luke to write the Gospel of Luke and the Acts of the Apostles. He, he wants to get that message out. He wants to let these, these Gentile Christians who are facing persecution to know, yes, it was real. I, I didn't see it either, but I've talked to the people who did. I've I've spoken with the witnesses. I've seen the, the risen Lord in the body of Christ, his church. I have seen the miracles that his people perform. I have seen the lives that they live. And now Luke is a witness. He's, he's doing exactly what Peter was doing. He's, he's sharing the story that demands a response. And he's saying exactly what Peter was saying. He's saying, I'm a witness, and now that you've heard the story, now that you know the message, you too are witnesses. You now have a responsibility to react to the message, to respond to the message, and then share the message by what you do and by what you say. Tell people what you have seen and heard in the story of Jesus Christ. That's our call to action. 
we're called to react, to respond to the story of Jesus, the death, burial, the resurrection, and the mighty works that God has done. And not only are we called to share what we know in Scripture, but the real question for us Christians is, what are the mighty works that God has done in our own lives? What is God doing in our lives that that would demand a response from those around us? What is what about the gospel living within us? What about the grace that fills us, that makes people around us say, what makes you different? What There's something about your life that I, I, I need to know. I need to re- I, I have to question. It's something attractive, something that I don't have. What is that? And then we can respond by saying we have the gospel of Jesus Christ, the grace of God, the, 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 the mercy that flows upon us and, and we extend out to others. That that's really the call to action, to respond to the story and then become witnesses of all that God has done in our own lives. Share the message so that others will also become witnesses of the gospel of Jesus. Thank you for joining me in this sharing of the word.